our next speaker on to our very own Natasha. Natasha, very happy to have you here. Looking forward to your presentation, Herodotus on staying and fleeing at the Battle of Plataea. The floor is yours, Natasha. Thank you so much, uh, dear Hans, and I'm delighted to be here, dear everybody. So let me just explain what uh, my talk is going to be about. And as we are still in our sort of introductory mode, I thought that what I'm going to do with Herodotus, and of course, not with all of Herodotus, but just with one theme of staying in and fleeing in Herodotus is to analyze the sort of analyze the composition, the themes that Herodotus weaves together in a series of points and counterpoints as a literary text. Because I hope as we are trying to think both about memory making and history making and about the reale, whatever we mean by this point, beyond the making of memories, I think somehow it's necessary first to understand what Herodotus aims to do with handling of this theme in his history. So what is his agenda? And I'm thinking in this case about Herodotus as a master maker of collages, who produces a literary text in which he has a full control over the themes and motives that he chooses to weave together. So this talk will consist of two parts. First, I'll walk through the main passages in history that feature the themes of staying and fleeing, or mostly not fleeing. And this is going to be very familiar because it's really a tour of the greatest hits uh, in the histories. And I'm going to hopefully do it very quickly, but I also worry uh, about it being banal. But then another concern that I have is the opposite possibility of uh, them becoming unbelievable. So uh, between these two, perhaps there will be something, you know, not already obvious that would become clearer. And this is really my aim in this talk uh, to hopefully to push the boundary of things which are self-evident a little bit further. And of course, it's actually a formidable task, especially since I'm going to talk about something which intersects with research of two scholars whom I very much admire, Paul Christensen and Marcello Lupi, and who are both here and who do not agree on several points. So here I will proceed starting from the ob obvious and charting my course, hopefully carefully between what I can call the moras of emendations and the specter of Thucydides' derision. And I, I think you know what I mean. But so far, I explained only the first part of my talk. This is the banal part. The possibly less banal and maybe more unbelievable part of the talk is going to see how comes that the elements that Herodotus weaves together fit together so well, as I hope to show. That is to say, after we have seen the slant that Herodotus gives to various stories, will it be any easier to think about their historical counterparts? So, so essentially, what is the material, what are the materials from which Herodotus creates the collages for his own purposes? So with this, let me start sharing my PowerPoint. Here we are. Okay, 
So let's start the tour and the themes of fleeing or retreating and staying will definitely climax in the Battle of Plataea, but I want to give a essential, like it's essential for my purposes to give a tour throughout the history. And the theme of remaining in place information is sounded at the moment of introduction of the Spartans into the narrative of Herodotus, the battle of champions over the territory of the Syriates between 300 Spartans and 300 Argives. And dramatic date, note that I prefer not to give the chronological date, which is our modern reputation, but the dramatic date with which Herodotus synchronizes this story is the siege of Sardis by Cyrus. So there are this, there is a territory that is disputed between Argos and Sparta. Spartans and the, the Spartans and the Argives choose 300 champions each. They start to fight, all die apart from one Spartan and two Argives. And here is the sounding of the, the two Argives deeming themselves victors ran to Argos, but as we the Lacedaemonians spoiled the Argive dead, bore the armor to his own army, army's camp and remained in his place. Well, let's continue with the battle of champion. There is an etiology of hairstyles in commemoration of the battle at Thyreates, the Spartans grow their hair long while the Argives Cut permanently cut their hair short, and uh, the single Spartan survivor, Athriades, commits suicide in shame, which is quite surprising because, of course, uh, somehow his survival is the basis of the Spartan victory, and yet he is ashamed to remain alive, and after all of his still town are dead and uh, he kills themselves at Syria. I, you know, move some seven books and so next sort of loud sounding of the same theme is the description, the famous description of Mardonius of the way in which Greek wage war in a extremely stupid fashion. And this is a translation of Peter Kranz. So Greeks usually wage war in an extremely stupid fashion because they're ignorant and incompetent. When they declare war on one another, they seek out the best, most level piece of land. And what is and that is where they go to fight. The upshot is that the victors leave the battlefield with massive losses, not to mention the losers who are completely wiped out. So I am now going to stay squarely inside the boundaries of the narrative of Herodotus and not you know, going beyond into any kind of historical plausibility. What uh, I want to say is that in this description, the obvious parallel referent uh, is the Battle of Champions. And as the Battle of Champions goes, the description of uh, that Mardonius gives is actually quite accurate. Apart from the little fact that the losers have two survivors while the victors have one survivor, but both of them are more or less completely wiped out. Well, we continue to uh, the next, and I think particularly sort of striking sounding of the theme of staying, Demarato, the, the medizing Spartan king, is describing the way the Spartans fight to Xerxes. So he's saying 
they are free yet not wholly free law is their master uh, whom they fear much more than your man fear you they do whatever it bids and it bids is always IA the same, that they must never flee from the battle before any multitude of men, but, but must stay at their post and their conqueror. Would... So again, kind of recapitulation of the Battle of Champions. This is how the Spartans fight. Well, now we are coming to the next greatest hit. So Leonidas votes in the Council of the Greeks to stay at Thermopylae. And of course, you'll see why I'm singling out the theme of voting. So Leonidas votes to remain where they were and send messengers to the cities, bidding them to send help, since they were too few to ward off the army of the Midas. And then, of course, Leonidas at Thermopylae does precisely what Demaratus says uh, the Spartans should do and what the Spartans do at the Battle of the Champions. It is said that Leonidas himself sent them away, so the uh, other Greeks, because he was concerned that they would be killed, but felt it, 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 it not fitting for himself and the Spartans to desert that post, which they have come to defend at the beginning. And now, well, the Thermopylae, I don't need to uh, sort of repeat that, but uh, still let me just very quickly go through it. Of course, we have 300 Spartans, and there is a reference to combing their hair before battle, which the scout of Xerxes reports to Astonia. The explainer says that it is a tradition that Spartan grooms their, groom their hair whenever they are about to put their lives in danger. So at Thermopylae, all but two Spartans die. One survivor uh, who is sent away as a messenger, Pantaitis, commits suicide in shame over his survival. And another survivor, a survivor who had a case of blindness is dishonored and called trembler at Sparta. And we know from Herodotus, like, so Herodotus makes it very clear that he has great sympathy toward Aristodemus. And of course, Aristodemus, according to Herodotus, as we will see, is the best warrior because he, despite the fact that he's called Trembler at Sparta, he participates at Plataea and he fights from the, Sp from the point of view of Spartans, not quite in a Spartan manner, but from the point of view of Herodotus in a most spectacular fashion of all, all those at Plataea. Okay, so now we're already coming to Plataea and things start to be strange. So the Spartans are very nervous about facing the Persians and they are particularly nervous because they say to the Athenians, you know, you have experience of engaging with the Persians and we don't. And so they change with the Athenians once and then Mardonius also rearing troops and then the Spartans change second time places with the Athenians. And Mardonius is taunting the Spartans, repeating something which, you know, like the, our same theme sounded again in this, what I should probably inappropriately call fugue, so, men of Lycidaemon, you are sad by the people of these parts, being 
we, we have seen the Demaratus to be very brave men. It is their boast of you that you neither flee from the field nor leave your post, but remain there and either slay your enemies or are yourself killed. It would seem, however, that there is no truth in all this. For before we could attack and fight hand to hand, we saw you even now fleeing and leaving your station. Well, and then Mardonius says, what is there to prevent us from fighting with equal numbers of both sides, you for the Greeks, since you have the reputation of being their best, and we for the barbarians. And this looks like Mardonius is actually proposing to the Spartans to have like yet another battle of champions. But as a, um, the, well, what the answer of the, we see that somehow Mardonius, in some sense, he is still correct in the sense that he is, he keeps referring to that battle of champions mode of fighting. Yet we see that the paradigm is clearly not completely applicable because the Spartans do not answer. So there is silence as a response. And then they start an attempt of relocation. And at that point, most of the, uh, well, Mardonius is destroying the spring of Gorgophia and Greeks, the Greek forces now relocate and most of them just flee toward the temple of Hera at Plataea. And here is Amonfaretus who takes a stand. So Amonfaretus, son of Pleiades, the leader of the Titanate Lochos battalion, refused to flee from the barbarians or save by compulsion, bring shame on Sparta. And Posanias, is, well, he is, he is also famously taking a big stone in two hands and putting it by the feet of Pausanias, saying that this is his uh, voting stone not to flee from the Xenoi, being uh, the barbarians. So Pausanias calls him an insane madman, my nomen on kai u frenaria. What uh, happens? So then something interesting is uh, happening in the narrative. It is said that Posanias and Euryanax feel terrible fear for what might happen with Amonfaretus. What I somehow, you know, like this long review of quite obsessively hammered theme of uh, the Spartan way to fight, I think somehow, like if we take the, it all into account, I think it might actually shift our reaction to the interaction between Posanias and Amonfaretus, because uh, in the modern literature, very often, and you know, like we, we have already said it ourselves in this discussion, that that's a shocking um, instance of uh, disobedience. And yet, as we have seen, Demaratus is saying that what the Spartans are obedient to are not each other, right? So they are obedient to the law. And the law tells them to remain in their place and not to flee. And the law is unflexible. It just keeps repeating stubbornly the same thing. So when Amonfaretus and Posanias are coming into this argument, Amonfaretus has the weight of the Spartan tradition at least how, as it is represented throughout the history on his side. And I think the 
fear that Pausanias and Euronax feel might be also perhaps appreciated as not that Spartan, you know, somehow like why are they not just ready to, you know, let Amonfaretus do what a good Spartan sh should do, somehow let him fight and sacrifice himself. So there is a sort of beautiful, like the uh, scene, and once again, I'm staying squarely inside the narrative of Herodotus without thinking about the historical possibility. But the conversation between Amonfaretus and Posanias continues throughout the whole night until dawn. So, and you know, in my mind's eye, I see these two figures on the back uh, drop of like rising sun, and they keep talking to each other. And the verb that Herodotus chooses is anacrinomenos pros heautos. And is Marincola and flower, flowers come he is noticing. Well, the translation is wrangling among themselves. And yet I think this translation might not be doing justice to what is actually going on because as the as the commentators say, the verb is used only here in Herodotus and only here in all extant literature does it seem to mean quarrel. The active means interrogate, interrogate, examine. So perhaps we don't need to take this case as a special meaning of the word, but perhaps somehow this background of like how the Spartans should fight from the point of view of their presentation in the histories would show that, yes, we have an impasse here. And there are two possible views which are butting heads. And they are maybe not wrangling, but perhaps cross-examining each other. Sort of like, what is the way to be a Spartan? What is the way to fight as a Spartan? And well, Mardonius is, well, what happens, of course, is that eventually Posanias decides to move away, but just a little bit, really hoping that Mofaretus will join him. Adam Mofaretus cannot first cannot believe that Posanias already moved, but then he reluctantly and step by step Baden uh, moves his uh, unit and what kind of unit I'll. I'll return to that question. His uh, Lohos and they join the forces together. Mardonius is looking at it and he, now I am summarizing Herodotus, he jeers saying that he used to hear that the Spartans do not flee in battle, but that he just saw them leaving their battle position and running away. And so it's really like the same vocabulary repeated again and again and again. He concludes that the Spartans shown, showed themselves to be nobodies among other Greek nobodies. And, but, but this is precisely this sort of moment when joining the rest of the Greeks the location where they, where, where I mean, where Faretus joins other Spartans is near the temple of Eleusinian Demeter. And at the moment when the Spartan forces join, the, per, the Persian cavalry launches an attack, and then a Palmel general attack follows. And this is precisely the moment when the situation, which is seemingly becoming more and more difficult for the Greeks, is turning towards the, the victory, because the Persians break the ranks, and then there starts the the culmination of the 
uh, Battle of Plataea near the temple of Athenian Demeter. So what, how we can sort of put together this whole repeated sounding of the theme of do we, is it, is it okay to retreat, do Spartans, can, can they somehow about flexibility versus inflexibility can be summarized as follows. So Herodotus is showing both the heroic and powerful manner in which the Spartans uh, fight, but all like, and that's, that is the manner of the battles, uh, battle of champions. And at the same time, he is very aware of the excessive rigidity, excessive severity of this approach. And it is um, especially obvious in the fates of the survivors of both the Battle of Champions and the Battle of Thermopylae, who are ashamed to remain alive. So what I am playing with is thinking that essentially the Battle of Plataea provides some kind of synthesis in which Spartan inflexibility is represented by Amonfaretus is joined by a different, more sort of realistic way to fight. And I think what is interesting is that um, I think Herodotus might be showing us how the victory is essentially resulting from these two elements being combined because this place where the Spartans eventually are getting and which in the later tradition Plutarch of course tells us that the Greeks received an, an oracle that they should be fighting by the temple of Lucina and Demeter but uh, somehow this winning combination is created partly by the unspart worry for loss of life and partly for ultra by ultra spartan resistance to flee okay and if we momentarily leave herodotus because this is my sort of punchline for the analysis of the like of what Herodotus is joining together in his analysis of Plataea, I think the retreat of Amonfaretus, uh, which many scholars, including Lazenby, somehow they suspected that in reality Amonfaretus was just a rear guard. But uh, I think what can, like, can be seen here is perhaps that uh, the retreat, the unwilling, slow retreat of Am Amonfaretus is presented in the narrative like perhaps like a, something like a myth of invention of rear guard. This is how the Spartans actually arrive to this very novel and radical idea of retreating. And I think we see exactly the same theme in a very concise and different but and yet thematically very similar reference to the battle of Plataea in Plato's Lacus. So Socrates is leading a conversation about uh, courage with Lacus and he again was speaking about staying in place and fleeing. So Socrates as you describe, uh, let us make that man be courageous who, as you describe him yourself, stays at his post and fights the enemy. Lacus agrees. Socrates, yes, and I do too, but what of this other kind of man who fights the enemy while fleeing and not staying? 
like us doesn't even quite understand what uh, what are we talking about how fleeing socrates speaks about the ski fans and about Aeneas and like it says well yes yes you agree socrates like now you're speaking about chariots and you're speaking about the horsemen so cavalry fighting is like this it's back and forth you you can flee when you're a cavalry man but with men and arms it is as I stated. And Socrates, here is his uh, punchline, except perhaps Lachis in the case of the Spartans. For they say that at Plataea, when the Spartans came up to the men with witcher shields, they were not willing to stand and fight against this, but, but fled. When, however, the Persian ranks were broken, the Spartans kept turning around and fighting like cavalry, and so won that great battle. And Lachis, now, of course, agrees with Socrates, what you say is true. And the commentators on this short passage in Lachis usually are a little puzzled by the description because they say, well, the, Greek, the uh, Herodotus says that in the description of Thermopylae, the Spartans fight like this, retreating and then turning around and attacking the Persians, but nothing like that is happening at Plataea. So I think what we have is definitely not identical accounts, but just two versions of the same theme of the sport behaving in this interestingly flexible way both uh, like at Plataea and in one case, their retreat is very large scale. It's what the Amunfaretos and his unit are finally pressed to do. And in the case of what seems to be a popular tradition, and I'm sure that in a way Plato, so, you know, Socrates is not confusing anything. This is the tradition as it is passed through in Athens in the time of Socrates. And like, I, I find it very unbelievable that this would be something that wouldn't be a common version of the fighting at Plataea that Plato would be putting out. So the same kind of fleeing while preserving bravery. Okay, and then the coda it, uh, just sort of to hammer in the idea that so uh, Herodotus is really thinking in terms of like, what does it mean to stay? What does it mean to move around? He ends the story of uh, the Battle of Plataea by the reference to the Athenian Sophanas about whom there are two stories. And one is that he has an iron anchor, whom he, which he just puts in, into Mother Earth and doesn't change his stand, or that he, there was no iron anchor, but his shield, which is continuously in motion, has an anchor as a device. So like, I find this really like a meta reference to what uh, Herodotus has been sort of like the themes that he has been kind of uh, juggling all along. Okay, now the second part of my talk. And uh, I now I would like to just briefly think sort of like where does Herodotus get his themes of the Spartan inflexibility? Well, like somehow how, where does his material come from? And first of all, there are in the narrative of Herodotus really striking correlations between the battles. Of course, there is the John Dillery's article of 1996, which um, expresses great surprise about the similarities between the battle for Thyreatis and Thermopylae. So there are 300 participants, 
total death of nearly everybody, the reference to her and the reference to the shame that the survivors uh, feel. Then Thermopylae, and, and they're connected by the figure of Amonfaretus, who really just wants to be a second Leonidas and who votes for staying, and also by the figure of Aristodemus, who is just the only participant who participate, well, he doesn't quite get to participate in Thermopylae, but he finally participates at Plataea. And then they are, con they are very, very emphatically connected by the absence of the 300 best warriors, which amounts to complete unexperience with of the Persians. So the Spartans are so afraid of the Persians precisely because at Thermopylae, the Spartans were fighting in their accustomed manner. And so nobody would be able to tell how the Persians fight because everybody who could are already dead. And finally, well, Thyriatus and Plataea are also connected. Amumphoretus is kind of like his idea of fighting comes all the way back from the Battle of Champion. And when Mardonius is proposing to uh, have an equal battle, this is really very, somehow it goes all the way back to the Battle for Thyriatis. Okay, so now we're getting sort of into, I'm still trying to avoid the, complicated uh, arguments and the simple argument, a simple question is how are, how old are the best Spartan warriors? And we know, like, we know that there are several warriors that Herodotus um, refers to as the best ones at the end. And Aristodemus is obviously one of the older ones because he was one of the 300 Spartans who already had children whom Leonidas chose for his expedition. But we would expect when we think about the best Spartan warriors at Plataea, we would expect from probability the rest to be younger, there, that is not to have children, since the best 300 of the older ones are dead from Pla at Plataea. So all of the Spartan black belts of the older generations are taken out of circulation. Now, well, now let's sort of get to the historical correlate. The unit of Amonfaretus is several time, times called uh, the Pitana, Pitanate Lochos. And the question is why Posanias is so worried about it. And the obvious answer is that they are probably really valuable warriors. So these are probably the best warriors that Spartans still have. And now, if we are now thinking not in terms of Herodotus, but in terms of the Spartan system of uh, core, the best warriors at Plataea, the best and the youngest, uh, sh like it makes them automatically coincide. Well, it makes the idea of that the unit of Amphoretus is hippies or a part of the core of hippies, very attractive choice because the hippies are the best warriors between uh, 20 and 30 that the Spartans have. Okay, and this is of course not an original uh, suggestion. So Douglas Kelly proposed in well, just 40 years ago that Lojos should be hippies and Marcello Lupi developed Kelly's suggestion at great length and admirable detail and arguing that Pitanate Lojos is a subdivision of hippies. But then 
there are hippies actually are connected to other battles which we have just reviewed. So Thomas Figueira in the same year and the same volume that Marcello Lupi has suggested that the hippies were participants in the Battle of Champions. And he also suggested that at Thermopylae, the 300 were metonymically associated with the hippies, whatever that might mean. Okay, why does Thucydides roll his eyes? Because I'm going to speak about low cost and we are nearly off my presentation. So just a couple of comments. First of all, of course, famously, Thucydides said that there is no such thing as a pitonate lacos. But uh, when we look in Hero, applies the term lochos exclusively to the unit of Amonfaretos. So there are no other sort of technical description, technical references to Lohoi in Herodotus. What we do have are two instances of a word which are like which are coming from the same root. And once we have Sulohites, and it appears in the battle of for Thriates. So Asuriades was ashamed to return to Sparta after all the men of his company, should I say Lohos, had been slain. And we have the verb Lohageo, which is also used with Amonfaretos, and it appears with surprise, surprise, a core of 300 select, like, uh, select uh, picked men of the Athenians at the Battle of Plataea. So in Herodotus, the two words related to Locos are both associated with groups of 300 select warriors. And now here is my possible historical solution. I think like what we have is the following. The Battle of Champions is really a foundational myth for many things. And I think it's for my, from my point of view, it's obviously, you know, a battle where everybody dies is um, not a realistic battle despite Thermopylae. So it's an ideological myth for the elite unit of 300 hippies. At, and at Thermopylae, the myth is being recaptured. You know, like it's a full scale reenactment of that myth by the body of quasi hippies. So Amonfaretus, he really would like to recapture this myth again. So, and I think uh, this is precisely somehow the, the, if we think about the historical Amonfaretus, his uh, belonging to the corpse of hippies uh, makes this ideology particularly strong uh, for him. So the hippies are those Spartans who need to die the same way people died at Syria. And now the question is, why does Herodotus not tell us that Amonfaretus is uh, leading, a, you know, a unit of hippies? I, uh, I think the Herodotus agenda is that he is not interested to highlight a historical role of an elite unit. He prefers to create an impression of a more generalized pan-Spartan ideology. And I think the we think about the term that he uses, pitonate lochos. This is very obviously very late, but I find it very interesting that in Hesychius, the pitonate host is ex 
explained as the host of the Greeks, either also on account of its part, here is metonymy in action, or because of Menelaus, who was pitonate and for whose sake they waged war. And once again, Marcello Lupi shows in an admirable way how like later references to pitonate lochos are usually uh, like they have associations of younger warriors. But here I want to focus on this very anemically potent overtones of the pitonate lochos. So the Herodotus possibly uses this term to achieve sort of the widest range, you know, to make the unit of Amamphoretus as pan-Spartan and perhaps pan-Greek as possible. And this is where I'll stop. Thank you so much uh, for uh, bearing with me. Thank you, Natasha. We're, we're a little over time in the sense that we're, no, well, we have 15 minutes until regular end date today, but we might want to decide to move on just a little longer. Questions and comments, and I see two hands up already, Ian and David Yates and Paul Cartledge, and uh, they're all coming up one after the other. Yes. I was just going to add a couple of little things about, so the Anna Crino, that whole thing, especially the way that com combined with Imam Faridis's use of a pebble as a boat, I mm -hmm. think is kind of on point. So I think that that's actually really an interesting sort of uh, use of terminology jargon, even a specific terminology there. So I kind of support your reading of that. The other thing I wanted to point out was that Athens is not running at the time of a Momphoretus thing. They actually stand in formation, unafraid and unmoving. And that's in 54. So I, I think that it's it's worth pointing out that a Momphoretus isn't the only one sort of standing his ground. Although the Athenians, it looks like as soon as the Spartans are ready to go, they'll follow as well. But they're just waiting to see how it all turns out. The other thing that I wanted to mention, though, was... Socrates in Plutarch is noted for leading a small company back to safety at Delian in 424, the idea being that once the shield wall breaks, if you retreat in order, your likelihood of survival is far higher. So this is something that I think very much supports your, your reading, that there's maybe some strategy or order to retreating in information. So I don't know if that was just three things I thought about. So. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. And yes, I, it, it has been always my favorite passage describing Socrates at, at Delium, of course. But like concerning the Athenians, I think the Athenians kind of got it right from the start. So the Athenians, they're both, you know, they're quite essentially fleeing because of course Delphic Oracle gives them this terrifying oracle of like flee away don't stay in Athens so they already got the fleeing part you know like internalized and now they 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 know both how to flee and how to stay it's the Spartans who are inflexible somehow not knowing how to flee and need to learn at Plataea. So Thank you so much for this talk. This was really stimulating. I did have a question though. I, I was the 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 Plato passage describing sort of what happens to the Spartans of Plataea. That strangely got me thinking about Thermopylae, when Herodotus says that you know you know that the Spartans were pros and the barbarians weren't because the Spartans knew how to pretend to retreat and then flash back around once the Persian line broke and slam into them. And that really got me thinking, you know, I mean, at, at least from that passage's point of view, and of course, the, the retreat that, that's being described at Thermopylae is very, very different from the one that I assume that Emin Freitas is accusing Pausanias of considering, but, but it's still a tactical withdrawal. And, and it would suggest that at least at some level, the Spartans not only know how to do it, but they seem to know how to do it really well. And it seems to be something that everyone knows they know how to do really well. And I was wondering if, if, if you, you could respond to that a little bit. Yes, I think... 
we are here maybe dealing with precisely agenda of Herodotus, who is interested in sort of setting up this so, like ultra inflexible Spartans because the way uh, that Herodotus describes the maneuvers at Thermopylae seems to me very believable, but uh, he somehow like brackets that all you know, in the mind of Amonfaratus, who seems just not to not not to think in those terms. So for him, it's just sort of like standing stock still. I just had a comment, uh, Natasha, about Pitana. And of course, it's the Doric R at the end. Every reference we have to it, where it's specified, suggests that it's the smartest of the five Obai or Komai. And if my memory serves, and it may well not, Pausanias the Baedeker, the traveler, says that the tombs of the Aegead royal family are in Pitana. And Pitana has been identified by modern scholars with Magula in the northwest of Sparti. So I imagine that both Pausanias and Amonferatus were what the Greeks would have called, if they were from Athens, fellow deems men. And actually Herodotus uses the word demos when a Spartan would have used oba or um, coma. So is part of it a kind of, not exactly power struggle, before the battle, I mean. It's not just arising uh, immediately at Plataea, but they know each other terribly well from their regional affiliation by birth and ascription. So there's quite a backstory to this little dispute. I well, I, I'm sure, though, I really, you know, like, I, it doesn't come through in my uh, presentation because, uh, like, I was trying to be relatively concise, but I, of course, need to like when I'm thinking about it, I am very aware of the fact that Amonfaratus, if he is a hippie, if he pays, he is a young man, and that he is, yes, sort of impulsive and ideologically sort of passionate, as I think a neophyte in the like sort of incalculated with a particular ideology would be so so like it is a long it's probably a long conversation but in that conversation i'm Faretos used to be probably very young well a uh, sub-adult most of the time but remember Parsonius, the the regent he's pretty young too right right yeah, right yeah. so two two different ways to be a young spartan yeah uh, <laughs> <I think so. laughs> 